Kate Mulgrew is an actress and author with an extensive career on stage and screen. From her start as Mary Ryan, the lead role on the popular soap opera Ryan's Hope, to the groundbreaking first female starship captain on Star Trek Voyager, to her acclaimed performance as Galena Red Reznikov on Netflix's smash hit Orange is the New Black, Kate brings a formidable presence and deep passion to all of her projects. Her 2016 book, Born with Teeth, allowed her to add New York Times bestselling author to her resume. Her new book, How to Forget, A Daughter's Memoir, was published just earlier this month by William Morrow. Now, please join me in welcoming Kate Mulgrew. Thank you very much. This is slightly disturbing. I feel that I should lead you in some kind of prayer, which escapes me at the moment. Um, I'm actually delighted to be here, uh, namely because my daughter lives here and I get to see her. Um, <clears throat> but because Seattle has a lot of meaning for me. I fell in love here once. Oh, yes, I did. I came over to do a play. I was engaged to an Italian man, and I was living in Florence, Italy. And I said to my Italian uh, fiancé, oh, just let me go to Seattle and do this play. And chop, chop, I'll be right back, and we'll get married and have 500 babies, and everything will be heavenly. All right, but you go, finish, finish. I said, okay, go. I came, and I instantly fell in love with the associate artistic director of the Seattle Repertory Theater. <laughs> and I married him. And I had a baby here, Ian, and got pregnant with another one, Alec. And uh, that changed everything. So tonight's going to be quite interesting. Be merciful. I'm going to do a reading. Is that good? I struggled with what to read to you tonight. Because I've been on the road this week, and I've been reading other excerpts. But I thought for Seattle, I'd mix it up a little bit. I hope you don't mind. This is a book about um, the deaths of my parents, but without putting too fine a point on it, it is uh, more about the resonant effects of their deaths and what they meant to each other, the loss and the grief that was experienced while they lived, unexamined after they died and only now considered by me with brutal honesty in this book. My father died of uh, lung cancer. It took him three weeks. That was a really wonderful way to die, fast, just like him. My mother had Alzheimer's. That took her nine years. So that was, as you can well imagine, ghastly, and I'm sure there are a few of you in this room who are experiencing that right now. So the story is, I went home for both of their deaths. Uh, I'm going to start, the part one of this book is about my father. And I'm going to uh, read to you from chapter 11. And to set the stage, the first page or so is a flashback to when I was a little girl. Then I will pause, and you will know that I have reset to the present time in the book, which is the week my father died. So, without further ado from chapter 11. In the dead of night, it began. The first bubbles of amusement reached me like tiny balloons that had traveled from my mother's mouth through the slightly ajar master bedroom door, beneath the crack of my own door, and finally to the folds of my eight-year-old ears where they settled gently and then softly burst. I sensed with prepubescent acuity that something highly unusual was afoot and slipped from my bed with the dexterity of a child long accustomed to eavesdropping. Across the hall, where they slept, the light was still on. Although their bedroom door was ajar, it was not generously ajar, 
and I knew I would need to steel myself for some serious sleuthing if my efforts were to be rewarded. I crept across the hall on tiptoe, stopping every foot or so to reassure myself that I had not been discovered. No, they were far too engaged in whatever it was they were doing to give me a second thought. My mother's infectious laughter made me feel anxious, and I was shocked to find myself alone on the upstairs landing, since such laughter was fit only for the daytime and would surely awaken my siblings and call them to arms. No one else, evidently, could be bothered, or else they had fallen into such deep slumber that even an incident as remarkable and disturbing as this could not rouse them. This is why I am different, I thought, plastering myself to the wall adjacent to my parents' bedroom door and ceasing to breathe. With exquisite slowness, I turned my head and finding a vantage point through the crack of their door, adjusted my gaze so that I could have an unhampered view of the crime scene. In the bed, my parents lay together. My father's bedside lamp was on, illuminating the drama. I had only to raise myself on the highest of tiptoes to gain a perfect view. I proceeded to do this while clinging to the wall with lizard-like fingers, damp and splayed. Silently, voraciously, I studied them. My father lay on his side, dressed only in his light blue boxer shorts. This was startling, since I seldom saw my father in his underwear, let alone in his underwear in bed with my mother. Bare-chested and grinning slyly, he had caught my mother's hand with his own and appeared to be speaking to each of my mother's fingers individually, which effectively sent her into paroxysms of hysteria. When he had finished talking to a finger, he folded it gently but firmly back into my mother's hand. If she allowed the digit to reemerge, he would look sharply at her, and shaking his head, he would spank the tip of the errant finger with his own bossy finger, causing my mother to scream with delight. They lay facing each other, he in his boxers, she in her white flannel nightgown, her face suffused with merriment, his with pleasure, when suddenly I felt the blood rush to my cheeks and my heart began to pound so loudly I was afraid they would hear it and turned to find me spying on them. At exactly this moment, my father leaned into my mother and hidden by the tall walnut footboard, disappeared from my view. I think it might be time, I said softly, leaning on the footboard of my parents' bed, wearing my mother's handmade apron and wondering what to serve for dinner that night. It had been two weeks since my father's diagnosis, and my siblings had arrived to keep vigil, both those who lived in town and those who came from far away. Everyone needed to be fed. Cocktails would be served around six, my brother's jazz CDs slid into sentience, and familiar bodies would begin to saunter in and out of the kitchen, looking for comfort. Not yet. Christ, it hasn't even been two hours, Joe said unpleasantly. They told us to look for the grimace. Well, there it is, Bo. That's a grimace. He's in pain, I responded, curbing my anger. This exchange had occurred every day, sometimes more than once, since hospice had taken over. Joe had agreed to hospice when it became obvious that Dad would not be emerging from his coma. The end game, he knew very well, was also the game of mercy. This meant the administration of morphine. Joe and I were straightforward with each other. I did not feel the need to be careful with him as some of my other siblings did, and yet his stubbornness prickled me. It seemed to me willful and petulant to withhold the drug simply because of an arbitrary timetable, one recommended by women who were skilled in the business of death and what it does to people who are unwilling or unable to face it. What the fuck is your rush? He'll die soon enough, Joe said, bitingly. Don't lash out at me, Joe, I warned, slipping a chill into my voice. I'm on your side. My brother's words stung because I suspected that they were, in part, true. Wrapped in my mother's apron, 
serving dishes from my mother's oven, commandeering the sick bed and the old man in it, I knew that my thinly veiled arrogance often masqueraded as self-righteousness. Time to get the dinner on, time for hospice, time for the morphine, time for the sponge bath, time for a break. As long as I kept moving and moving briskly, all would be well. Up and down the stairs 10 times a day, checking the coffee pot, checking the laundry, writing the market list, simmering the sauce, staying constantly, irreproachably busy. In that way, I could walk the plank and at the same time count myself among the most stoic, certainly one of the most organized. The trick was to keep life going at a real clip so as not to feel the plunge into emotion too keenly, to not feel it at all, if possible. The objective was to trip over the death of my father with only a very slight bruising to the heart. As for my father himself, I wanted him to disappear quickly. I almost wanted him to surprise us. The fact that I wished for such an end for my father did not sit well with Joe. He had his own ideas about the getting of oblivion, and being surprised was not one of them. Joined as we were by this morbid need to assist our father in the act of dying, we were divided in our opinions as to how death should come. My brother clung to the idea that my father would want to die naturally, that he would choose to forego palliative drugs. Attached to my father was a stoicism based, I could only conclude, on his reticence. Where others spoke, my father had retreated into a hard stillness, the veneer of which frightened everyone away. This ongoing taciturnity had endowed my father with an unassailable authority and cowed the more voluble among us into whispers. As the years unfolded, my father had sought the confines of his self-imposed hermitage with increasing determination. The mere prospect of having to be within 20 feet of an animated conversation between two women vexed my father so much that as a matter of course, I would swing shut the door linking the TV room to the kitchen. Even then, mother and I modulated our voices so as not to nettle my father, who, sufficiently incensed, might stalk in and, shaking his head, say, Jesus H. Christ. If this made me laugh, he would pause on his way to the coffee pot and hold his right hand aloft, bringing his fingers rapidly together in a code well known to mean, the incessant chatter of women is intolerable. Why then, I wondered, would my brother assume that our father, so near death, might yearn for the very sounds that only a month earlier had driven him crazy. Was the incessant chatter of women more palatable from the depths of a coma? Would that noise, which had so clearly offended him, transform itself into music, simply because he was dying? How very odd and strangely amusing to think that this man, who had disdained any form of idle conversation outside of the drunken, might suddenly long to hear the raised voices of his womenfolk mixed with the darker tones of his male progeny. And even more curious was the suggestion from our hospice nurses that our voices might have a salubrious effect on our father. It was a well-known fact, they assured us, that hearing was the last sense to go. It made me nervous to think of my father straining as if from a too great distance to catch the threads of our deathbed conversation. All of the women instinctively lowered their voices upon entering the master bedroom, and if the talk was too impersonal, subdued them still further, until a conversation about something as mundane as a bad hair job reduced them to tones so hushed as to be indecipherable. If it was true that hearing was the last sense to abandon the corporeal ship, why then did everyone immediately slip into muted cadences when they walked into the room? Even those who moved directly to my father's side, where they often knelt, spoke slowly and softly into his ear. It never occurred to me that their questions might be reaching my father. And even if this were remotely possible, that my father might consider these questions answerable. From the depths of a cancer-induced coma, 
I simply could not imagine that a query as perfunctory as, how are you doing today, TJ, might elicit a response. I imagined the inquiry would have to travel like a tiny bee through wads of cotton wool, which would absolutely dement my father. By the time the bee stung, he would wish himself well and truly dead. Joe considered the liberal use of morphine a kind of aiding and abetting and counseled discipline. What felt like anger coming from him was, in fact, sheer frustration. The thought of our father in pain caused him great anguish. But even more disturbing to my brother was the thought of our father trying to communicate and failing because he was completely narcotized. The prospect of a last minute reprieve from which our father might rouse himself to speak was something my brother wished for until the end. I wanted our father suckered with efficiency, mourned with dignity, and buried quickly. Joe wanted a word, a gesture, a look, one last moment of connection, during which love would be conveyed and understood. In this way, he could bid his father goodbye and go on living. Okay, Bo, have it your way. We'll look at him after dinner, I said, knowing that this suggestion would alarm my brother, signifying, as it did, a long cocktail hour followed by an even longer dinner, at the end of which time our father might very well be in agony. Joe's love for our father rose swiftly to the surface as he pushed the little blue packet into my hands and said, you better hope it's a fucking grimace. As I withdrew the small syringe from its nesting place inside the cushioned kit, my heart sank. What if my brother was right and I was wrong? What if, after all was said and done, our father could hear what was being said, and even more distressingly, wanted to hear? What if, at the end of this journey, he longed for the last vestiges of human sound to ease his way. Can you hear me, Dad? I asked, removing the small cap from the tip of the syringe. The hospice nurse had shown me how to administer the drug by pressing the syringe into the flesh of my father's cheek and waiting until the small barrel had been completely drained. I knelt beside my father's bed and studied his face. Although I had not yet given him the morphine, the grimace appeared less extreme than it had only moments before, and looking around for verification, I was startled to find myself alone. Joe had left. He didn't like to watch as the grimace relaxed, leaving our father's face as smooth and blank as a mask. My father did not respond to me, although I had hoped he would. Like my brother, I held out hope that I would be the one he could not resist. Take me out of this, kitten, he might say to me, or better yet, good girl, give me more. But my father said none of these things, and I knelt there for some minutes deliberating as to whether the severity of his grimace warranted a dose of the drug. As the voices of my siblings rose from below, hungry and restless, I knew that they would soon be expecting their dinner. I heard the distant tinkle of ice and glasses, the cool, brassy strains of Miles Davis, someone's laughter. I don't think so, Dad. I don't think you can hear me, I said, and gently opening my father's mouth, inserted the small plunger into the flesh of his cheek. When I withdrew the syringe, I looked at my father in consternation. The grimace was still there. That's the end of that chapter. Thank you. <laughs> now, I'd like to read a chapter about my mother. This is chapter 39 from part two of the book. My mother had been diagnosed with Alzheimer's about a year and a half before and I had gone home to Derby Grange, which was in Iowa, to visit her. She wore a bracelet now, and walked past the little red Taurus hatchback as if the giving up of that possession had not broken her. It had. 
Seven years earlier, when I had surprised her with this gift, she had cried out with joy and approaching the car as if it were a newborn, tenderly kissed the hood. Then, after allowing her hands to travel over the body of the car and peering excitedly into the back seat, she had stopped to exclaim over the size of the trunk, already imagining it stacked high with paintings. Beaming, she had stood and declared, I will name her Ruby and she will be mine, mine, mine. But seven years had passed. And when I told her that the time had come to stop driving, that it was no longer safe, she stood and stared at me in disbelief. Then, shockingly, her eyes filled with tears and she began to cry, a state to which she seemed oblivious. She wept, and as she wept, she fought to retain the one privilege that still promised independence, the right to get in her car and drive away. I talked to her of danger, of children at crosswalks, of tiredness, of forgetfulness. After 10 minutes of this lecture, she stopped listening, and I watched as her anguish dissolved into indifference. A brief internal scuffle ensued, during which her features underwent a series of swift, inexplicable changes before a curtain of blankness dropped, obliterating any trace of the distress she had been feeling so acutely only moments before. Two months later, we decided to take a walk down the gravel road, and as we started out, passing the little red car now sleeping in the shadow of the glen, my mother said, I have a game. Uh-oh, what kind of game, mother, I asked, stopping to marvel at the host of tiger lilies that annually bloomed at the foot of the stone gates. I was sure my mother was going to suggest that we visit the beehives hidden in the woods. Let's go to that house, she suggested, pointing at one of the newly constructed houses on the road. My heart sank. This sudden development of oversized modern houses on a road that had long been a dusty ribbon winding through fields of corn, past farms boasting hundreds of acres of land, continued to appall me. Having grown up in the countryside, with the nearest neighbor a quarter of a mile away, and town itself strictly a weekend aspiration, I could not bring myself to accept this strange archipelago of cookie-cutter structures, all of which seemed to have erupted overnight like enormous mushrooms. Whatever mischief stirred this sudden impulse of my mother's, I knew it wasn't entirely innocent. My mother harbored a resentment of these recently sprouted edifices, all of which offended both her sense of history and her sense of taste, while at the same time arousing in her a mordant curiosity. She wanted to see what lay hidden behind the clean brick walls, so new to the sun and the rain, the front lawns brandishing toy cars and pink plastic swing sets, the two-car garages sheltering brand new automobiles and bright green lawn tractors. Surpassing her interest in all of these novelties was my mother's overweening curiosity about human beings, particularly human beings she might otherwise never encounter. What are you suggesting? That we just walk up and ring the bell? I asked, stopping in the middle of the road to face my mother. Yes, say we're on a walk and that I'm, you know, she tapped the side of her head. So, this is how it was going to be. I was to approach the house, ring the bell, and announce to whomever answered that my mother was not quite right in the head, but that she wanted very much to see the woman's lovely house, and, if it was not too objectionable, would love a guided tour. <laughs> I shook my head at the bizarreness of it, but had to admire my mother's pluck. As we approached the front door of the house, my mother and I linked arms. We stepped onto the cheerful, unblemished welcome mat, and tightening my smile, I lifted my hand and pressed the doorbell. Almost immediately, the door was opened by a stout, middle-aged woman wearing a man's flannel work shirt and blue jeans. Her unruly blonde hair was pulled back into a ponytail, and her feet were bare. I instantly surmised that today was house cleaning day, 
and that my mother and I had not chosen wisely. Hi there, the woman said, smiling warmly. How do you do? I wanted to introduce myself. I'm Kate Mulgrew, and this is my mother, Joan, I said. We live down the road, and we were just out for a walk when my mother told me she has always wanted to see your house. She's fascinated by how people decorate, especially a house this size. I looked directly into the woman's eyes and smiled conspiratorially, indicating that this was entirely my mother's idea. Whatever wariness she may have felt when she opened the door suddenly dissolved, and as she swung the door wide to allow us in, our neighbor said, my name's Angie, come on in. The place is a mess, today's cleaning day, but sure, have a look around if you want. As we crossed the threshold, my mother and I looked beyond the small foyer and were immediately struck by the immaculate condition of the living room. White pile carpet stretched from one end of the room to the other, and my mother, as if drawn by a magnet, preceded us into the space and whispered, blinding. I laughed and said, She's blinded by the carpet, and so am I. My God, it's so clean and bright in here. I had seldom seen, an, I had seldom seen a room in quite this state of spotlessness. Oh, don't look too close, Angie warned, pushing back her hair with one hand. An industrial vacuum cleaner waited on the step leading into the living room, and I wondered if every day wasn't cleaning day in Angie's house. Don't you have young children, I asked, shaking my head in wonder. Oh, they don't come in here, Angie laughed. They wouldn't dare. You've got hidden rooms for rambunctious children, I suggested, smiling devilishly. I can imagine, I can only imagine how spectacular those rooms are. Angie could not resist. Basking in the glow of our awe, our neighbor offered to give us a tour of the house. My mother clapped her hands and I happily assented. You're sure it's not inconvenient, I asked. As long as you don't mind the mess, Angie warned, in the manner of one raised to conceal pride behind a show of modesty. My mother's wish had been granted. Past the living room we went, into the oak-paneled wide-bottomed den, whose walls exhibited framed photographs of Angie's children, beribboned, slick-haired, and miserable past the large and gleaming utility room, and into the kitchen where, incredibly, a plate of fresh-baked chocolate chip cookies rested on the counter. The space was impeccable. I cocked my head. Could Angie possibly have been expecting us? Impulsively, I said, looks like you're expecting company. Angie chuckled. Oh, no, that's just a snack for the kids when they get home from school. I bake most days. Incredulous, I turned to my mother, who hummed for a moment and then said, if you like cookies. This remark in no way deflated our hostess, whose cookies I was confident had been featured at many a school bake sale, and she continued to lead the way down the hall into the garage. My mother caught my sleeve and whispered emphatically, bedrooms. Angie stopped and asked, what's that she's asking? Oh, she's terrible. She's dying to see the bedrooms, I replied, affecting shyness. At this, Angie blanched. Oh, no, no, no. I can't do that. I'd never forgive myself. Some of the beds aren't even made, and Doug, that's my husband, he's got his stuff lying around all over the place. Angie's cheeks reddened and I understood that the bedroom signified an intense, if narrow, intimacy that was strictly off-limits to strangers. Quickly, she led the way down a darkened hall that opened into the garage, where two machines gleamed in the shadows, one a black SUV and the other a dark blue Chevrolet Malibu. The husband must be driving yet a third car, I mused, watching out of the corner of my eye, as my mother, humming, approached the garage door and asked, does it open? Obediently, Angie pushed a button and the automatic door began to rise. A blast of sunshine greeted us when we emerged and my mother threw open her arms and cried, life! 
I thanked Angie for her hospitality and her great kindness in indulging our whim. She stood there, arms crossed, and I realized that she had taken a risk in allowing us into her home. There was a good chance that she had recognized who I was, in itself a cause for wariness, but she had in no way demonstrated this. Instead, she had chosen to understand that my mother was not herself, would never be herself again, and that she could put her cleaning aside for a few minutes and make an old woman's dream come true. When I turned, I saw that my mother had started down the road toward Derby Grange. Her face was tilted toward the sun. In her hand, she held a black feather. When I caught up with her, I pulled her arm through mine and asked, well, wasn't that fun? My mother considered this for a moment, then tucked the feather in her sleeve, shrugged lightly and answered, medium. <laughs> a cloud of dust appeared at the bend in the road, and when it had settled, I recognized Sam's car speeding toward us. He overshot us by a few yards, screeched to a halt, then skidded backward. Rolling down his window, he looked at our mother and said, Hello, sweetheart. Are you collecting feathers? Are you visiting bees? What are you up to? No good, I answered dryly. You won't believe what she just made me do. Well, I want to hear all about it over a beer. Split one with me, huh? He asked, grinning at our mother. Our mother stood beside me, her eyes fixed on her son. She blinked, then brought her hands to her chest. I think that means we've got a date. I'll race you, Sam shouted, putting his foot on the gas and disappearing through the stone gates. I stared after him and had taken a few steps before I realized my mother was no longer with me. Turning back, I saw that she was standing where I had left her. She was looking past the stone gates, into the front yard where Sam now stood, waving his arms and shouting at us to hurry up. My mother spoke so softly I needed to lean in. Not taking her eyes off the figure of her son waiting for her in the front yard, she said, The one I love. Geez, Mom, thanks a lot, I responded. I thought I was the one you loved. <laughs> Pulling the feather from her sleeve, my mother pointed it toward the front yard and said, this time more emphatically, that man is the one I love. Well, I should hope so. He's your son, I said. Who? My mother asked, looking up at me apprehensively. Sambo, your son. You know, mother, that crazy guy over there shouting at us to hurry up, I said, waving back at my younger brother. My mother, standing very still, not taking her eyes off Sam's shape in the distance, put her hand on my arm. No, no, she whispered, as if shocked by what I'd said. That is the man that I love. I stared at her for a long moment, then nodded very slowly as I realized that she had meant every word she had uttered and that it was I who had misjudged her intention. Suddenly, and completely without warning, her brain had transformed her son into her lover. My mother and I slowly made our way across the yard to where my younger brother waited for us, oblivious to the fact that his identity had changed and that walking toward him was a woman who was about to turn his world upside down. There you are. So, those are a couple of excerpts. The first one was, I think, rather dark. The second one should give you a good idea of where we were in the darkening thicket of Alzheimer's and what can happen within the space of a moment. And she stayed in love with my brother for three years, really quite deeply romantically in love with him, and then he became someone else. Uh, these transformations are not unusual in Alzheimer's, but as you can imagine, um, deeply unsettling.
to a family of six siblings who had to watch their once vividly creative, smart, talented, funny, gammon mother disappear forever. So without further ado, I would like to open the church <laughs> to questions, and I hope that you will feel free to ask me anything. Please. Any questions? Yes, sir. I was reading the passage where you were talking about your uh, father uh, n only watching sports on the television set. And I was curious if he had ever seen any of your work or if he was just only sports and supported your career and that was it. Well, you haven't finished the book. No, no, <laughs> not yet. He never saw me act. Once he came uh, when I was doing... Uh, Tamara and Titus Andronicus, Andronicus at Shakespeare in the Park in New York. And the only reason I knew that he was there and that my mother had dragged him was because when, at in, intermission, I heard his voice rising up from the din, when the hell is halftime? <laughs> that was the one and only time. No, my father thought acting was goofy. And Star Trek escaped him altogether. <laughs> I mean, he was deeply perplexed by it. Well, wait a minute, what the hell are you doing? You're up there, where are you? In a ship? What kind of a ship? You just told me you didn't get any gas. You got lost. I mean, the whole thing was just an absolute. So no, but I think it ran deeper. So that is examined in the book. What father of an arguably quite successful actress would spend 35 years in deliberate sort of um, refusal I think it had to do with my relationship with my mother, which was unusually, inordinately tight. And she often came to me. I pulled her away from my father. And I think he probably resented that. And who knows what else he resented? My early success, perhaps the money. Uh, but he was uh, constantly and unflaggingly critical of my choice of career. And yet I suspected that underneath it, he loved me regardless. But such are the suspicions, right, that one must live with. Yes. Hi. Uh, Hi. I spent the first 30 years of my life in Dubuque, Iowa, before moving to Seattle. So In Dubuque, Iowa? Yes. We have so much in common. <laughs> yes. So, so to say you're an inspiration is an understatement. Thank okay. you for sharing your story. And your writing is beautifully and so impactful. My question is... Um, what advice would you give to an inspiring author who has no experience and doesn't really write well to share their story in such an impactful way as you do? I am only going to guess that the aforementioned author would be yourself, madam. Um, you have to just write it, darling. And you have to write it with a kind of fearlessness. There's no confidence in this business. I came to this so late. I was 58 when I wrote my, I've only written two. Born with Teeth was written at 58, and I'm 64 now. I mean, this is a, a, a perilous, difficult, costly journey, um, the results of which are ongoing. They resonate. But I needed to do it, and if you feel that you need to do it, then you must. And you must exercise a, a discipline in your life. Sit down at your desk and write. And don't get up from it until you have produced something. Can you do that? Are you capable of that? And I would also recommend that you go away. You're very pretty, so I'm sure you're being bothered by men all the time. Get away from them and go somewhere and be lonely. Loneliness is a very good thing for writing. Devastating and very good. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Hello. First Hi. of all, thank you for coming to Seattle and happy belated birthday. Thank you. Um, my question is, my mom is in a similar situation to what you were in, as in taking care of your mom uh, with my grandmother um, at home. And as I go back, I see uh, less and less of what I knew of her as a person. And I was wondering... Um, of which one, your grandmother or your mother? My grandmother. Yes, of right. Yes, yeah, she's still with us, luckily. Um, and luckily? Yes, she's, you say uh, luckily. she's 86 and we almost lost her. Um, but she has dementia. 
yeah, she had brain damage, and so um, she's very confused quite often. And I wanted mm -hmm. to know um, what are things that your daughter did for you to help you get through this process, and what I can do as a daughter for my mom to help both of them. Well, my daughter, uh, my daughter's story is a different story, and if you want to understand that story, you'll need to read Born with Teeth. Okay. That will elucidate that for you, but. Uh, uh, my sons were youngish. They did nothing really particularly to help me. Um, I would counsel this, though. Um, if it's your mother taking care of her mother, that's too much. And that's too hard. Is she bathing her and taking her to the bathroom? Is she feeding her? Is she giving her her meds and all of that? Is your mother doing that? Um, she does full-time caregiver work, yeah. Well, it's, she can't. Yeah. She can fall apart. It's, because you mustn't forget that that's her mother that she's doing it for. So if there are any resources in the family of any kind, financial or otherwise, use them to give your mother a break. Because uh, she is sending her own mother into oblivion. And the other thing that I would say, which is hard to say, but I'm going to say it. How long has your grandmother been in this state? Uh, going on 10 years now. Well, I would hope, I would then wish for a death soon. Because dementia is merciless. Your mother is getting nothing, and your grandmother is getting nothing out of this. So the best that can be hoped for at this stage of the game is comfort, love, touch her, stroke her, tell her you love her. Get your mother out of that house. Take your mother to the movies. Take your mother to a walk. Tell your mother that she's great. Love your mother. She's with you. Your grandmother's already gone. Sorry, tough, true. Thank you, Kate. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. It's a church. You can hear the acoustics are great. Someone unrelated, but uh, what's your favorite place in Seattle? What is my what? Your favorite place to go in Seattle. I have to be honest about this too, don't I? Uh, well, obviously, obviously it was the theater. I mean, that's why I came and I stayed. I did lots of plays here. I mean, I was almost nine months pregnant when I played Solomon in The Misanthrope, with my son, Alexander. And in the scene, I'm being courted by Alceste, and he kneels down in front of me as I'm changing my wig, and he cuts my corset up, right, with his knife, and my huge stomach would fall out. The audience would gasp. It was heavenly. Um, we lived on Queen Anne Hill, and there were fun, fun, wonderful places up there. You know, I think it's beautiful here, but uh, the marriage wasn't so good. So, yeah, worrying around. Thank you for that question. Yes, yes, you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You forgot your question? Yeah, that's a good question. She's asking, did everybody hear that, how my siblings reacted to my writing this book, which is a deeply personal, very revealing book about our parents. Um, most of them were good. My sister Jenny was good. My brother Tom was good. Um, generous. Uh, and all of them are lovely. Now, make no mistake about it, I love my siblings deeply. But two of them are featured. Joe, in part one, it features prominently in the story of my dad because he was so close to my father and Sam in part two because he was so close to my mother. Joe is like my father in that he is extraordinarily private. So writing this is scratching something. And I am sorry that I have scratched at his privacy. I don't mean to scratch. I had hoped that it would be, because I talked to him all the time throughout the writing, and he seemed very acquiescent and quite helpful. I didn't mean it to offend or to hurt, but I think something in his mm, sensibility, something in his, perhaps his vulnerability, was, uh, was a bit attested by it. 
Uh, but that's, that's the price you pay. And my mentor, Anne Royfe, the great writer, when I went to her with this very question, said to me, that is the risk you take and the plank that you walk if you're going to write honestly. And why write a memoir if you're going to do otherwise? So I know that I have, but you know I needed to do it. This was not catharsis. This was a different kind of drive. It needed to be written. Thank you for that question. Yes? Yes, ma'am? I was wondering what your uh, favorite episode of Voyager was to film. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I really love Not to change the subject. <laughs> People ask that. You know, that was seven seasons. How can I possibly remember? Things fly. It, it had to have been the first one, the two-part of The Caretaker, because that was my introduction, walking onto that bridge for the first time, introducing myself as the first female captain in the history of the most successful franchise at Paramount. I mean, that was a big deal, you know? Thank you. And uh, I would say that it was my favorite because it was also the most challenging. It was perilous. You know, the, the brass at Paramount were very sort of nervous about putting a woman in the captain chair. They'd been very successful, very successful with men. And to give this a shot, was taking a big, really rolling the dice. So for at least seven months, they came every day and stood on the lip of my bridge like this and watched me. And I just thought to myself, you can watch till the cows come home. But my name is now Captain Catherine Janeway, and this is my ship. So, caretaker, yeah. Yes, yes, ma'am. I would not have written it had my parents been alive. I would not have dared. It would have, it would have hurt my father, I think. And it would have, uh, it may have delighted my mother. Uh, but the, I come from, you know, patrician Irish stock, snobs. You don't reveal this stuff. You don't give it away. Uh, that's why she said to me when I was 12, and she came to my poetry recital, I thought I was going to be the next, you know, Edna St. Vincent Millay. And she said to me in the car going home, you know, I got to tell you something, kid. You can either be a really mediocre poet or a great actress. And I think you should take the latter route, don't you? And that was the end of that. So that indicated to me that, mm, you know, this, that's probably why I came to this so late. But I think it must have resided within me all those years. I just held it there somewhere. And now it's here, and I have to tell you this, as if I'm sharing a secret at a church, which I am. Oh. So satisfying. So satisfying to me because I've been an actress for 45 years. You know what that's like? Well, probably not, but... <laughs> I mean, it's constant showboating, inhabiting characters and doing stuff. This is inside. This is private. This is me. Do you know? And it's just me and my words, my computer, Ireland, loneliness, solitude, whiskey. Any other questions? Yes, sir. About uh, your experience with Alzheimer's, my great grandmother on my dad's side had dementia and Alzheimer's, and it's really, really painful to kind of watch that deterioration. And yeah. uh, um, it's it's good to hear about other people's experiences and, and how to kind of deal with that. But I have a different question that's not about that. Um, you were the voice of Flemeth uh, in the Dragon <laughs> Age series. And, uh, what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, I don't think you've ever done any other voice acting similar to that. I wanted to ask how that came about and whether you enjoyed it and whether you intend to do anything similar. Because... Well, I do do books, you know. Ooh. I do um, Stephen King's son's name is Joe Hill. I do all Joe Hill's books. And I've created some award-winning voices for Joe. Uh, Nosferatu. I created a voice. But I sort of did that with Flemeth, too, didn't I? Um, that was a video game. Yeah. 
I'm a little nervous about video games because I don't play them myself, so I don't understand them. You were excellent. Like, oh, thank you. She's why, dead, though, isn't she? She's dead. Is she dead? Yeah. Well. <laughs> why are you looking? Is she dead? Well, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 it's to be determined. I don't know. It's kind of like a cliffhanger kind of thing. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I like using my voice. Yeah. You don't have to do the rest of it. You're in a recording studio. It's, it's wonderful. Thank you for that question. Anybody uh, else? Uh, we've got time for two more. That lady there. Yes, ma'am. We have you mentioned time. mentioned whiskey as part of your writing process. <laughs> what kind of whiskey? Very good question. Spoken by someone. You, you like whiskey, don't you? Yeah. I like Jameson's because I'm a good Irish girl. But I had a friend come over to Ireland. She brought a bottle of Oban. And that night there was a full moon. So I lit all the fires in this beautiful house on the shore of Loch Corrib. And we went out under a full moon and we drank the bottle. <laughs> and it was absolutely heavenly. I mean, it's terrible to say this, but I do like whiskey. <laughs> yeah, I do. Now listen, I never drink when I'm writing and I have never once had a drink before acting, but I like it when it's all over, yeah. It's, it's earned then, isn't it? Especially in Ireland where it's so cold. Yes, anybody? Yes, sir, you. Yes, this gentleman on the end. This is less of a very specific question and more just kind of I want to get your, your feelings. Um, I'm glad somebody broke the ice with the Star Trek Voyager question because now I feel comfortable to ask this. You had a lot of intimate and really interesting relationships happening on Star Trek Voyager. I think the one that's touched me the most, I've seen it probably 15 times, um, is your relationship with Seven of Nine. And I just want to know from, the, from, the, from someone who was in that relationship, what was kind of your, your impression of that relationship? What was my impression of it? Or, or what did I feel what about your, it? Yes, what were your feelings? Well, I, I just love to hear you speak about that a little bit. All right, that's a good question. It's always a nerve-wracking one to answer because I'm split about this. Uh, in the fifth season, an actress was brought on to Star Trek Voyager uh, by the name of Jerry Ryan, who played the character of Seven of Nine. And she was absolutely stunning. And she represented sex. I mean, it was absolutely it was crystal clear. And uh, I mean, honestly, you remember Janeway looking at her boots and traveling up the body. I remember that. <laughs> now, I was of two minds, because there's nobody in the history of a television series who doesn't want their series to be successful. So I understand the need for sex, but I had hoped against hope that I could bring it in as Janeway without it. I didn't. I mean, I went to them in the first season and said, I'm not having sex. I'm not saying, red alert, into my ready room, Chicote, let's go, let's go, let's go. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I have a compliment of 165. I've got to get them home. And what, the captain's stooping again? You know, it, it makes no sense at all. So Seven of Nine appears, and she's half human, and she's half Borg, and she's right? So to be honest with you, for the first season that I worked with her, I was just staring at her bosoms, her remarkable figure. And then I understood that they wanted it to be a mother-daughter thing, but you know, daughter, my daughter doesn't look like that. My daughter looks like a beautiful human being. It was a thing of, of, of bringing the male demographic, and it was very successful. They certainly like to watch Seven of Nine, and I don't blame them. Men like that, don't you? Don't you? <laughs> I'd like to take one more question, because you're a great group. Does anyone, yes, madam. You have, I see you have your comm badge on. I'd like to take that. That lady, wearing the comm badge. Hi, thank you. I wanted to thank you for coming to Seattle. We actually drove like five hours. Did today. you? Where'd you come from? I spoke hand. Did you? Thank you for making that journey. Sorry, How nice. Uh, well, I just wanted to thank you for portraying a very strong woman. Sorry to subject you to another Voyager question, but for portraying a strong woman in the captaincy, because that was really inspiring to me. It was inspiring to my mom. And I was just wondering what you have to say to a woman going into science right now. Going into science? What would I say to that? Anything. <laughs> oh, I think that it's absolutely the right time. 
And if I had even one scintilla of influence or impact on that reality becoming a larger reality, I will be gratified until the day I die. Science is for women. Women should go up, not into the room, right? It's to be explored and known by women. You know, when Mrs. Um, Clinton, Hillary Clinton, had me to the White House at the end of the first season to speak to, get this, ladies and gentlemen, the most renowned women in science that she culled from all over the world, there were like a hundred of them, me, to speak to them. <laughs> I stood at the podium, I had the speech, I mean, I had worked furiously, right? You could imagine the nonsense that I'd written. Yes, well, I think in the field of science. I just stared at these geniuses, and I went with my speech. I said, it's you, it's you, you, you. The only thing that I represent to you is the truth. Because Paramount's not gonna spend billions of dollars investing in a woman captain if they don't see this as the future. And you are the future. And I think I've had a tiny bit to do with that, and I would say to you, if you want it, baby, go get it. We need you. Thank you very much, Seattle. Thank you.